Hey everyone, Pugs here, and by popular demand, I'm here reviewing the Spongebob Squarepants movie! This is a pretty big undertaking for me, especially because, as you'll be hearing me say multiple times, reviewing a movie is a little outside of my wheelhouse. But because I love Spongebob, I'm willing to give it a try for y'all here today. And I've got a lot of things I'm going to talk about, so let me start moving through my introductory points here. Well, first, y'all already know what it is, gotta say thank you to everyone watching today. It's true for a lot of these videos, but it's especially true for this one specifically that I would not be doing this without y'all's support. So, because this is a movie and not an episode, the way I'm structuring this review is going to be a little different. Hopefully it works because reviewing movies is much more difficult than reviewing episodes for me. <laughs> but basically, and you should already be able to tell because of the timestamps, I'm breaking up the movie into its plot, characters, comedy, and then other miscellaneous things that don't fit those categories. And also, I'm dedicating a section to talking about the view that this movie is the canonical end to the show, since I've got some thoughts on that that have been influenced from some discussions I've had on the forum, and I wanted to share those with you all. And lastly, I will not be giving this movie a rating. Um, in my written review, I gave the movie a tier, but I just don't want to this time, because I gave all the movies the same tier, <laughs> and I think you should be able to tell um, from the way that I talk about this movie how much I like it. And I think this is enough preamble out of me, so why don't I hush up now and just get right into it. I thought a lot about what aspect of this movie I might start with, and I think the best way to begin is just by talking about the transition from 11 minute episode to 90 minute movie. This is actually one of the things I like best about the Spongebob Squarepants movie. I think it does a fantastic job at balancing feeling like the show while also feeling like its own thing. The movie has to make a lot of changes in order to be what it is, which is like a more extreme version of what specials have to do in order to be what they are. This movie has to have a real, actual plot, even more complex than the most complexly plotted episodes of the show. But I'll get into that in more detail in my, dis in my section discussing the plot. But I mention it here because that's merely one of the many changes this movie has to balance with the aspects of the show it doesn't change. For example, one of the things I'll also be detailing is the comedy. This feels like the humor of Spongebob Squarepants, simply moved to the big screen. And the general vibe of this movie truly is that this is the show, simply in a different aspect ratio. It's really important that this movie achieved this balancing between feeling like the show and feeling like its own thing, because how I see it, if it feels too much like the show, then we'd all be like, why is there even a movie in the first place? This is unnecessary. But if the movie had strayed too far from the source material, then we would have been like, well, this isn't Spongebob at all. So there really must have been an impressive amount of effort put here to craft this movie to maintain this perfect balance. Really, I think the movie avoids this problem altogether. It makes itself relevant by having a big, adventure-filled plot with higher stakes and twists and turns, which is something that wouldn't quite fit into a regular episode, for the most part. Yeah, I'm thinking of Patty Caper. What about it? Anyway, the other side of this is that the movie also stays true to its Spongebob roots by utilizing the same type of humor and staying true to the characters, which are two things that I'll be detailing later. And the last thing I wanted to mention in this section is that the movie, or this movie, at its heart, is directly speaking on um, and about the child-adult line that this show slash franchise balances. That's peak Spongebob Squarepants right there. And I suppose that now is a good time to discuss the plot, since I've been dancing around it for a couple minutes now. Writing this section was probably the most difficult for me, since I didn't want to do a play-by-play -play like I do with my episode reviews, so I'll discuss the plot in more broad strokes, so to speak. Alright, so in the broadest terms possible, this movie is about Spongebob and Patrick embarking on a quest to retrieve King Neptune's crown from Shell City, the gift shop, after Plankton stole it so that they can save Mr. Krabs from being literally executed. And during the course of their quest, they befriend and insult monsters, almost get their ass beat at a tough guy bar, get abducted by the gift shop owner, have an assassin chase after them, and meet David Hasselhoff. And I've still only covered just a bit of this movie. You see why this is hard? I really love the plot of this movie, and I think it overlaps um, a bit with the section where I detail the characters, but the reason I love the plot of this movie is because it's got real heart. It's a coming-of-age story where the moral is you shouldn't lose your inner child. Rather, you should embrace it. It's a movie that works for all ages, reflecting the way the show manages to appeal to all ages. Another thing that works about the plot is that there are some pretty elevated stakes here. With the introduction of King Neptune and then of other locations like Shell City, the world of Spongebob Squarepants is expanded past Bikini Bottom. And yes, I know we've already seen King Neptune before, but ignore that right now just like the movie ignores it. But anyway, Mr. Krabs in this movie is literally going to be executed by his king. That's pretty serious. Spongebob and Patrick literally die. 
plankton literally enslaves people in the most child-friendly way they could portray that without changing what's actually happening. This movie has some serious stakes, which helps make it stand out as something different from the show. And part of the reason this movie can have stakes is because of the long runtime. Threats can be built up, like Dennis. It also allows for emotional stakes, such as what I already said about Spongebob and Patrick literally dying. Alright, so let me talk a little bit about the characters. I was debating whether to start with the big one or not, but I think I'm, I've just got to start with the man, the myth, the legend himself, Spongebob. Spongebob is this movie. He is the heart of what this movie is about. He carries the movie on his back. This is his movie. And what I really love about this movie is that Spongebob has a character arc here. And that's another difference between the movie and the show, which is that there's time for characters to go through true arcs and learn lessons. Sure, the show has characters learn lessons all the time, but it's still a lesson taught in 11 minutes rather than 90. But anyway, back to Spongebob's character arc. His arc is that at first, um, he doesn't want to seem like a kid because that's what he needs in order to be to get in order to um get the manager position at the Krusty Krab. But during the whole course of the movie, Spongebob eventually learns to embrace his inner child anyway, culminating in the climax of the movie with Spongebob's monologue and Goofy Goober Rock. Fun fact about this last scene, but many, many years ago when I was much younger, I performed that monologue for a talent show. That's the closest I ever became to being a theater kid. Yeah, no, I would, I would never be one of those. Anyway, going back to Spongebob's um, arc here, I think it's really important, even if the last part of the movie is played for laughs, that Spongebob embracing his inner child, his goofy goober self, does not lessen his ambition. I think that's the really important piece for adults watching. Spongebob still earns his manager position at the Krusty Krab, is still eager to have it despite Squibber's philosophizing, and he does so while still maintaining a hold on his inner child. We as adults do not need to be forced to conform to this idea of maturity and professionalism, which is actually a result of capitalism and colonialism and racism, but nobody has time for that. Um, no one has time for me to get on a soapbox right now. But basically, I think Spongebob's arc is important for children and adults, and it's kind of especially relevant given the more modern idea of embracing cringe. I am cringe, but I am free and all that. I don't necessarily vibe with that phrasing of the general message of just be yourself because I don't find myself cringe. If other people cringe or think I'm weird, that's their problem. But anyway. While I'm on this specific arc, I think it's also important to note that other characters, particularly Mr. Krabs, also see value in embracing one's inner child by the end of the movie. Perhaps Mr. Krabs does not necessarily encourage this, but he recognizes that Spongebob is worthy of the position, and judging by the end credits, he certainly makes use of Spongebob's enthusiasm. Perhaps I could pretend this is a commentary on the way that capitalism is adaptive and will suck you dry, but I'll hold off on that. Anyway, Mr. Krabs here is a good character, even though we actually don't see him all that much. He's the one who sets Spongebob off on the spiral of disliking his childishness, but in the end, he's grateful to Spongebob for saving him, some something Spongebob could only do because of his childish nature. I think I just really liked that the movie gave me my father-son crumbs between Spongebob and Mr. Krabs. I suppose that next I'll spend some time talking about Patrick. Patrick is really a force of comedy in this movie, but what I really like about him here is how much he's a ride or die. Spongebob's gotta go to Shell City? Well, move over, move over because he's coming too. Spongebob's crying about not getting the promotion? Patrick's helping him get drunk on ice cream. Hell, we even see how much of a friend Patrick is from the very from very early on in the movie, when he suddenly appears to congratulate Spongebob on getting the promotion he didn't get with flags and parachutes. Patrick's presence is steadfast in this movie. Spongebob and Patrick's friendship is not the focus, but it's there and it has a presence. Shows how in times of big personal change, you need a friend by your side. Patrick also, of course, acts as a foil, or probably that's not the right word or whatever, in some ways, um, being even more of a baby than Spongebob. Sure, he goes through the same whole journey of being a man that Spongebob does, but he doesn't really show any outright anger about being considered a child, from what I can remember. Shows again the more constant nature of his character in the movie, because he's su just supposed to be a comedic, steadfast presence by Spongebob's side. A character who kind of surprised me in this movie was Squidward, and when I say I'm surprised, I mean that I'm surprised about his role in the movie. For one thing, I'm almost shocked that he did not go on a trip with Spongebob and Patrick, and I think that speaks to a difference between eras of Spongebob Squarepants, because I'd say nowadays the show uh, focus, focuses heavily on the Spongebob, Patrick, and Squidward trio, perhaps just the Spongebob and Squidward trio, or duo, while back when this movie was made, Spongebob and Patrick's relationship was more paramount. Though I suppose in Sponge on the Run, it was just Spongebob and Patrick, so I don't know. But anyway, 
So Squidward does not join SpongeBob and Patrick, which I think actually works out better in the end because it allows those two characters to go on the journey of adulthood on their own without the smart ass quips that would surely be coming from Squidward every two seconds. The point of SpongeBob and Patrick's journey, or one of them anyhow, is to contrast their childishness with the very adult and serious environment and consequences of their journey. But let me get back to talking about Squidward. So there isn't much for me to say about him in terms of comedy, since he only had some jokes, including the famous who's gonna sign my paycheck line. One thing I really liked is that since this movie is a movie, it can have a B-plot. And the B-plot in this movie is, of course, checking back in on Bikini Bottom as Plankton begins his takeover. And what I really like is how Squidward plays a role in it, almost acting like a hero, except he has no plot armor. <laughs> also, that scene was very nearly kind of scary, or at least disturbing. The scene when uh, Squidward... Squidward confronts Plankton was also meant to show us what those bucket helmets were really for and the scope of Plankton's plan. So it's just some tight writing to see a scene accomplish so many different things. And you know what? Let's talk about Plankton. So as I've mentioned before, it's after season three that Plankton and Karen were promoted to main characters of the show. Actually, it was this movie that marks that transition since they were billed as main cast in the credits. And Plankton's appearance in this movie really demonstrates that change. Not so much Karen, but that's a problem this show has had since the beginning that I'm still avoiding um, actually discussing, so I'm going to focus on Plankton. So obviously, Plankton is the main antagonist of this movie and of the show. And this movie is his most menacing and threatening appearance yet. I mean, first off, he does actually steal the formula. And then we also see what his version of ruling the world is, which is an unambiguously awful thing with the way he er, deifies himself and enslaves people. And obviously this all happened because of this movie upping the stakes, but I think that this movie also uh, is also what instituted the Plankton plots I talked about in my review of Plankton's army. Because Plankton plots require us as an audience to find Plankton an actual threat in some way, and to see his getting, and to see his getting the formula as a bad thing, perhaps beyond um, just bad for Mr. Kraz's business. I think this movie makes both of those things quite clear, and it doesn't do so while losing some of the charm of Plankton's character. He's still very much a loser here, he just happened to stumble upon his most intricate plan yet, and it worked. It just couldn't account for Spongebob's childish nature being the one to undo his schemes. And now I'm just gonna lump some of the other characters together. So of course there's King Neptune, who as people have said time and time again, is a different King Neptune than the one we know from Neptune's spatula or even games like Battle for Bikini Bottom. I don't think there's an explanation for this other than the creators just thought this King Neptune would work better, and that's fine with me. Movie Neptune being different than show Neptune helps, uh, I think helps the two products stand apart from each other. And King Neptune in this movie is funny with his insecurity about his hair and pompous attitude, though he is uh, quite quick to the execution punishment. Which is why I guess Mindy is there, who is his daughter that we meet in this movie and then never see again as far as I know. Uh, which is fine with me. Mindy was a good character, I really liked her design, and I like that she didn't take up too much time in the movie, neither of these two characters did. They're both more like plot devices. I can imagine that in another timeline, Mindy joins Spongebob and Patrick on their adventure, and I don't think that would have worked well. Not just because of Patrick's hitting on her that would have eventually become uncomfortable, but because we'd have to deal with spending a lot of time with this character we're not familiar with. And especially considering that we already have a very large cast of characters to choose from, I just see adding a whole new one for a long period of time as unnecessary. Moving to the end of this section, I think that one big flaw of this movie is related to the characters, and that's that we don't get enough screen time for many of them. And I understand why that is, to make the movie um, not feel so bloated, but I think that is something that the next two movies improve on, making the cast feel more like an ensemble one. Again, this is Spongebob's story, so it makes sense that he's the primary character featured, but I think it would have been nice to get scenes of what other characters were up to in Bikini Bottom besides just Squidward. We only get brief appearances of Sandy, Gary, Mrs. Puff, and even Karen to a certain degree, and Pearl, and I think we could have gotten more than that. Or really that we should have gotten more than that, especially if this was supposed to be the end of the show, but that's something I'll be discussing later. Um, so this section about the comedy is gonna be rather short, but I thought I'd give some attention to the comedy of the movie. It's really good. As I've been saying over and over, it's that perfect blend of child and adult humor, which makes the movie enjoyable for everyone. And the humor feels exactly like the kind we'd be seeing in the show. Like there's detailed close-ups, visual gags, wordy humor, etc. I guess the only part of the movie that is really different is that the live action segments are not very clearly low budget. Which speaking of, I liked those bits with the pirates. Was it random? Oh absolutely, but this show is known for such things. I also really liked that the pirates sang the theme song, it gave a certain gravitas necessary for the movie. Alright, now let me speed run um, some other parts of the movie that I wanted to discuss. 
First, I've been holding this in, but I gotta talk about the art. I love the design in this movie. The animation style is really clean and emulates the Spongebob look while also doing something a little different. It's clearly the same show, but it's also clearly a different product. The backgrounds are also gorgeous all throughout this thing, and y'all know I love my backgrounds. I just think the world design is simply fantastic. And there's even some smaller things about the design of this movie I like too, like the entire concept and execution of the paddy wagon. I love that. I also love the design of the thug tug. And while I'm here, I'll talk about some audio design, in this case, the music. The background music in this movie is good. A lot of the tracks are movie originals, of course, but there are a few tracks that are also used in the show um, here as well. Helps keep things cohesive. And the actual songs in the movie are also really good, from the Goofy Goofy theme song to Now That We're Men to Goofy Goober Rock to, of course, Ocean Man. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the feelings involved in watching this movie. This is a movie that gets me quite emotional. Not that I cry when watching it or anything, but I feel all kinds of emotions while watching. Frustration when Spongebob doesn't get his promotion, excitement over the adventure, etc. But of course, I perhaps feel some of the most emotion when we do uh, reach the scene of Spongebob and Patrick dying. Even thinking about that scene gets me metaphorically choked up. The way they sing the Goofy Goober theme song while drying out, God, that was done so well. It's one of the scenes in here that demonstrate the importance of Spongebob and Patrick's friendship without making it the direct focus. And the scene is kind of just really dark because yes, we literally just watched our favorite characters die. Luckily, the tier X Machina stayed, saved them and allowed for the Cyclops to get his ass kicked by other dried out fish. The other part of this movie that gets me emotional is the ending because of how satisfying it is and how earned it feels. It's so wholesome as well, especially the credits with Spongebob doing all his little managerial tasks. So cute. And with Ocean Man playing, oh man. Ocean Man is a song that evokes a lot of nostalgia in me, and this movie as a whole is quite nostalgic. I watched this movie so much when growing up, and the iconography of it showed up in my life in a variety of ways. Like when I was younger, I used to have my computer wallpaper be that of Spongebob and Patrick staring at the paddy wagon, or my most sentimental book, a book I've had since I was learning how to read. It includes a story recounting Spongebob's dream sequence at the beginning of the movie. So this movie brings me a lot of good memories. And perhaps one of the reasons for that is because it's still got quite a hold on pop culture because of how simply iconic it is. This review is already long, but do you know how long it would be if I actually sat here and talked about every single line and moment that made the movie for me? We'd be here all day. Spongebob shouting when he thinks he's been promoted, the bald jokes, you don't need a license to drive a sandwich, the scene at the thug tug, everything with David Hasselhoff. There's so many moments that I have um, that have imprinted in my mind and others' minds as well. That's one of the reasons why there are season one through three dick riders. I think most of those people are motivated by nostalgia, but that's a conversation for another day or perhaps the next section of this video. Because now it's time to talk about the elephant in the room, the widespread knowledge that this movie was supposed to be the end of the show until it was greenlit for season four. I've got a lot of thoughts about this. So just about everyone knows that Hillenburg had wanted the show to end after the movie. That commentary has been exhausted and beaten to death. However, what a lot less people know is that the movie was not supposed to be the chronological end of the show. Yes, it's true. At no point was this movie the canonical end of the show. Vincent Waller, current supervising director and executive producer of the show, has said this on Twitter multiple times, and those links are in the description and a picture of it is on the screen. Now, I will say that it is true that Waller did not work on the movie and was not in the show crew when the movie was made, but given his extensive history with the show both before and after the movie, I'm inclined to take him um, at his word on this. So, perhaps that the movie was never meant to be the canonical end of the show is new information for some of you watching. I'll be honest and say that it's new information to me as well, which is why if you read my um, written review of this movie, you'll see me saying that I won't budge that this movie is supposed to be the end of the canon timeline. But thinking about it, it makes sense. It was always weird that this movie was supposed to be the canonical end of a show with no continuity. I also think that people saying that the fact that the Krusty Krab 2 has never appeared again, or other things, are proof that this movie is the end of the show, makes literally no sense, since that's more proof that the show is no continuity. And of course, there's crickets about Goofy Goober's ice cream party boat reappearing. Recently, a fellow forum member posted a thread about why they don't see the Spongebob Squarepants movie as the canonical end of the show. The thread is linked in the description for anyone who wants to see the conversation or join in themselves. Um, I really liked this post because it made me reflect on my own assumption that this movie is the end and my defensiveness when anyone would say that it's not. 
And that thread has made me realize that I no longer see the movie as the canonical end of the show either. I think to hold on to this idea that the movie's the canonical end is a symptom of nostalgia blindness and putting the first three seasons on a pedestal, but I'll get into that in a second. The reason I don't see the movie as the canonical end anymore is because it only works as an ending for the first few seasons. Remember how I was saying the movie only really featured a few characters? Could you imagine if this movie came out now? At the very least, the lack of Sandy in the movie would surely not fly. Additionally, Plankton has become much more of a frenemy presence. A movie like the second or third would be a far more fitting conclusion to the show as it exists now, which makes sense given that those movies are far closer to the contemporary era than this one is. I also would be very surprised if the show is ever given a canonical end. The last episode of the show may very well be a special, but I don't think the vibe is going to be this is the end of the timeline, because again, this show has no continuity. And so lastly, I'd like to turn back around and talk a bit about why seeing the first movie as the canonical end of the show is a common element of those that I like calling the season 1 through 3 dick riders. In my opinion, season 1 through 3 dick riders cling to this because it allows their childhoods to be wrapped up in a neat little bow. Because that's what drives dick riders, childhood nostalgia. The first three seasons are the gospel because they were these people's childhood, and when the show um, started seemingly changing in season 4 and beyond, they couldn't handle that, hence the strong backlash. And the movie being the canonical end narrative fits nicely into the entire modern Spongebob bad narrative created by these folks, completed with those phrases like jump the shark, or flanderization, or disrespecting Hillenburg. It's all just bias, taking things in bad faith, defensiveness, and simply not being open to being wrong or to new things. And there's nothing wrong of finding the first three seasons to be the best. There's nothing wrong of finding the first movie to be the end of your personal canon. However, when you start attacking newer seasons for these reasons and not interrogating yourself about why you might be doing that, that's when I have a problem. You can say that the first three seasons are your favorite without shitting on the others. You can say that the first movie is the end of your personal timeline for the show without saying that others are wrong or without saying it that's evidence that the creative output of the show after the movie is lesser because Nickelodeon disrespected Hillenburg. Now, I'm no defender of Nickelodeon. Fuck Nickelodeon. But my problem with that disrespectful rhetoric is that it's always, it's almost always used to shit on modern Spongebob, not to point out that Nickelodeon is a fucked up organization. It's virtue signaling through and through. And that's just one of the many reasons I can't stand seasons one through three dick riders. As always, I can't get through a review without giving my closing thoughts. This review was very long. Much longer than I anticipated. If you can believe it, I wrote this script in one day. It just started flowing and there it was. I had a lot more to say about this movie than I thought, and I don't think I'll say much else now because I don't want to prolong things. I'll just say that this movie is important to me, just like the show is important to me. And because this show is important to me, I'm, begin I'm excited to begin reviewing season four. So I think I'll just leave y'all with that, and I'll see you all in the next review.